Okay, so we're carrying on from the moment where Amelia begins to discover what's occurred. Um, Amelia asks Desdemona when Desdemona kind of has this this momentary um, incident or this momentary fr kind of fragment of consciousness she, before she dies. And Amelia asks her, oh, who hath done this deed? And Desdemona importantly says, nobody, I myself, farewell, commend me to my kind lord. Oh, farewell, and then she dies. Now, it's hugely significant here that she protects a fellow from blame before she dies and preserves that sense of virtuous nobility that Othello has throughout the play doubted. Here, it's much on evident, and there's this huge tragic irony involved in the fact that Othello only apprehends and understands this at the moment at which she dies. So, here, she demonstrates the nobility in death, which actually contravenes his vision of reality. And that, that I think, is one of the, probably the, the moment of, of tragic realisation that, that's so central to this final scene. A little further on, Othello very quickly admits to the fact that it was himself, that it was him that killed her. And, and the language of, of race is never far away from the rage that ensues against Othello. He tries to justify it by saying she's a liar gone to burning hell, t'was I that killed her. And again, he cannot see reality but through the lenses of, of religious morality and abstraction, that he's trying to convince himself that she's sinful, even though at that very previous moment she had demonstrated precisely the type of nobility and honour that has been so, um, well, absent from his understanding of her. And then the contrasts in morality are established in the following dialogue between Amelia and Othello through these kind of these moralized terms and the black white binary that's, that's so consistent throughout the play in language. Amelia says, Oh, the more angel she, which contrasts with the devil that she calls him. She labels Othello. And she says that, him, that he's a blacker devil and that she actually is this kind of pure angelic form. Othello says she turns to folly and she was a whore. So again, he tries to use this kind of religious moralizing vocabulary to justify himself and that Amelia is drawn into a kind of just as faulty pattern of thinking by by using this terminology to understand him thou dost belie her and thou art a devil now the the strange uh, there's an odd quality about Othello's simile here she was false as water because water is conventionally seen as a I would say a symbol of, a symbol of purity and of fluidity. And I think perhaps what that reveals to us is that A, his vision has been warped. If he's seeing something that's a conventional symbol for purity, it's something that's unreliable. And also it's kind of fluid formlessness, I think, speaks to his desire to fix reality and to, to concrete, well, I mean, concrete abstractions are a kind of oxymoron, but that speaks, I think, to his, his, his mental disposition, that he wants to fix things through the lens of abstract concepts. Amelia then uses it turns this type of language this sort of archetypal language of, of fire and water the elementals back on Othello thou art as rash as fire to say that she was false or she was heavenly true so again Othello's rash as fire I think plays into this overarching racial stereotype throughout the play that characterizes Othello as you know sinful as devilish as impulsive as um as black and as villainous and, and here she immediately uses that language to to make sense of him in the wake of this great tragedy Othello says Ocasio did top top her and it kind of mirrors that language that Iago uses now very now there is an old black ram topping your white you and he says, oh, I were damned beneath all depth in hell, but that I did proceed upon just grounds to this extremity. And here, his morality is actually compromised by this ethical vision. He, he, he's 
adamant that there is an ethical justification for his behaviour. And so his actual understanding of morality is compromised by this. He very briefly declares that it was Iago that knew all of this, and Amelia seems to suddenly apprehend the entire situation. My husband, my husband, that she was false to wedlock. Again, Thilla says, I, with Cassio, nay, had she been true, if heaven would make me such another world of one entire and perfect chrysolite, I'd, have not, I'd not have sold her for it. Uh, again, pay close attention to this, this language. If heaven would make me such another world, it would make me an entire world out of one entire and perfect chrysolite. He wants an entire world made out of this precious stone that's fixed and actually lifeless. And that, I think, reveals everything we need to know about the way that he's seen Desdemona as, a, as an abstract ideal and as something that he values for its... Um, it's, it's, it's non-human qualities. Amelia keeps on, though, my husband. Aye, it was he that told me on her first. An honest man he is, and there it is again, that ironic terminology. There's a huge dramatic irony evident here that we know the entire plot has been facilitated and, and created by Iago, and that Othello's understanding of him is, is so far away from the truth at this moment in time. An honest man he is and hates the slime that sticks on filthy deeds. I think that that is something that they have in common. And I think that's part of the way that Othello is manipulated, is through this understanding of him as in some way um, hating this, the actions of sexuality, I think, is what we see in this particular statement here. He, he sees that, that I think that's something that they both have in common and that's part of the way in which Iago manipulates it is by identifying that sense of common ground. And filthy D, you know, this this borrows this language that he or echoes the language previously in the play when he talks about um the system for toads to procreate in. The system of foul toads, notic and procreating. That language that he uses when he describes Desdemona almost as this kind of pool of stagnant water. And Amelia keeps saying, my husband. And Othello gets irritated by this eventually and says, what needs this iterance, woman, this repetition? I say thy husband. Oh, mistress, villainy hath made mocks with a mockery of love. My husband say that she was false. Again, Othello gets annoyed. He, woman, I say thy husband. Dost thou understand the word? My friend, thy husband, honest Iago. And I think what we see again is, is a sort of inverse of Othello's use of the word wife, that word that seems to be pivoting and, and, and demonstrating the shifting understanding in Othello's mind as he uses it. Here, I think there's a kind of inverse version of this, of Amelia recognising and fully apprehending reality and the truth. I think these repetitions demonstrate the, insta the shifting instability of language and vision. You know, we see throughout this scene constant repetitions of phrases like this that are actual categories, really. They're categories and abstractions and roles for people to adopt. And again, they seem to constantly be shifting in their meaning to various characters. If you say so, may his pernicious soul rot half a grain a day. She wants, you know, he, she uses the type of hyperbole that, that Othello uses here to, earlier on in the play when he says, you know, he would have the appetite to murder as many, uh, Cassio as many times over as he has hairs on his head. Here, she wants his nasty, violent, horrible soul to rot forever, basically. Half a grain of day, half a grain of sand in an hourglass, I think is the image that Shakespeare's trying to conjure here. He lies to the heart. She was too fond of her most filthy bargain. So here, she's describing a, she's describing a fellow at the same time. She's, well, she's using this hostile uh, metaphor to describe their relationship as a most filthy bargain. And again, that dirt and blackness is not far away from her descriptions of him. But I think importantly what that does also reveal is is the intensity of her affection of Desdemona's affection for him in spite of that racial hostility that is just always moments away from the surface this deed of thine is no more worthy heaven than thou was worthy of her so here what you see is that 
the deed of murder that Othello has committed here is obviously criticised in moral terms by Emilia is no worthy heaven. You, you, you can't use it to justify um, your moral approach. But not only that, that, that the tainted morality of that murderous action is equivalent to the, the, his absence of worth in the relationship with Desdemona. So, you know, he is effectively as bad as murder. And so her value is, his value, sorry, is no more than criminal as a, as a black man. And I think that's an important thing to recognise, the, the, the speed and, and vitriol that's involved in Amelia's criticism is, is all racially inflected. She says, thou hast not half the power to do me harm as I have to be hurt. She can un endure all the pain that he can inflict. Oh, gull, oh, doll, oh, you gullible fool, you idiot. As ignorant as dirt, again, that, that connotation of taint and sin and mud and blackness. Thou hast done a deed, I care not for thy sword. And this is a kind of uh, a verbal kick in the in the soft regions. That his inter not, he's not only being racially accosted, but he's now also his military prowess is being dismissed. I'll make thee known though I lost twenty lives. And this mirrors his own language. I will taint your reputation. Everything now is being unraveled for him. And she again uses that ethnic language to identify him. Now, Emilia challenges Iago when he arrives with Graciano. Disprove this villain if thou beest a man. He says thou toldst him that his wife was false. I know thou didst not. Thou art not such a villain. Speak, for my heart is full. And again, Iago's language is almost this kind of language of the salesman. I told him what I thought and told no more than what he found himself was apt and true. He told him his thoughts, his thoughts in this particular, he uses language here, Yaga, that is deliberately compromised and evasive. You know, he, I told him his thought, what I thought. We know that his thoughts are malleable, protean, shape-shifting, and can be bent into whichever shape he desires, much like the people that he manoeuvres around him. And told him no more than what he found himself was apt and true. And th th there is a kind of tragic truth about this that he do, he does find everything himself apt and true but it is this part is a lie i told him no more which is a lie because his own thoughts and beliefs are are not actually expressed you know it's provoking thoughts and beliefs in othello that he manages to to carry out without directly articulating them until that final moment and and it, the the tragic part is is that he found himself apt and true that word apt is really coming back to the tragedy of vision that this play is sometimes read as you know that othello actually found reality matching iago's manipulations and his lies and by doing so, Shakespeare is revealing to us the instability of our vision and the unreliability of the things that we see. Now, Iago gets frustrated with Amelia, as we see, and she finds out that he does actually admit to this. And Iago tries very hard to adopt the kind of patriarchal dominance that women are subjected to at this moment in time. And he says, what, are you mad? I charge you, get you home. And then Amelia courageously refuses here. So says, good gentleman, let me leave, let me have leave to speak. It is proper I obey him, but not now. Perchance, Iago, I will never go home. And I think something that's really important that you see in here is this is an unraveling of order. You know, the, the, the sense of social order that is part of this cosmic connection between the universe and the divine right of kings and society itself is unraveling around the characters in this particular tragedy and Amelia here in her courageous rebellion against Iago's patriarchy demonstrates one thread of that order that is unraveling as we speak and I think that's part, partly what the play is about you know the unraveling of that social order as you know realism and humanism starts to take its place on the cultural stage now, here, Iago, Othello falls on the bed and wails, oh, 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 and Amelia says, nay, lay thee down and roar, and again, he uses this kind of animalistic language, of animal um, verb here, to, I, I think, make sense of Othello's behaviour through the lens of a racist stereotype. 
for thou hast killed the sweetest innocent that e'er did lift up eye. You know, again, she starts, she she utilizes this language of idealism and, and celebration that Othello is so deeply wedded to throughout the text itself. Graciano says, Poor Desdemon, I am glad thy father's dead. Thy match was mortal to him, and pure grief sure his old thread in twain. Now again, the, the extreme racism that's evident in this particular text, you know, that he's happy that Des, that, Des, that um, Brabantio has died, because he's died because the match was so deadly to him, Desdemona's match with Othello, you know, the, the, the taboo of a, of a cross-race marriage has killed him through pure grief, which has actually severed the cord of life, sure his old thread in twain. So we've got this incredibly severe hostility to their marriage that is, adds to the tragedy. You know, Desdemona has to be pure and um, an abstract concept almost in this final scene in order for the tragedy to hold that, that she had sort of transcended this extreme raci racist hostility and prejudice that her own father has died as a result of the intensity of this feeling. So it adds, I think, an element of nobility to the to the purity that we're already seeing in that character. Did he live now, this sight would make him do a desperate turn. Yeah, curse his better angel from his side and fall to reprobance. He's talking about committing suicide and fall to you know reprobance, the state of damnation that we see often in, in the morality plays from the era when the better angel is cursed from the side of the characters. Again, there's lots of echoes of morality plays in this particular Shakespeare. Solo says... Tis pitiful, but yet Iago knows that she with Cassio hath the act of shame a thousand times committed. Again, it's a kind of hyperbolic, dramatic pledge here that shows the, the unreliability of what he, he thinks he believes. Cassio confessed it, and she did gratify his amorous works with that recognizance and pledge of love which I first gave her. I saw it in his hand. It was a handkerchief, an antique token my father gave my mother. So what you see here is a juxtaposition of what is supposedly objective reality with his emotional hysteria. What he thinks, that he's seen a handkerchief in her hand, but this emotional hysteria is what has convinced him that this contingent evidence is objective proof. You know, acts of perception underpinned by hysterical revenge, desire for revenge and jealousy become, you know, provide the confirmation bias that he's looking for. So, again, one further incident that adds to this is that <clears throat> Iago's action here actually prefigures Othello's. Iago draws his sword on Amelia and Gratian says, your sword upon a woman. This is something that Othello does later on in the text and, and has already done to um, Amelia. And again, it, it's part of that overall featuring in, in or a fellow fulfilling the prejudice that Venice approaches him with throughout the text. Now, Emilia and Iago attack each other here. He calls her a villainous whore. And Emilia says, she give it to Cassio. No, alas, I found it and I did give it to my husband. Filth thou lies. This is where she exposes his role in this plot. And this is what we, this is what Othello starts to realise. By heaven, I do not, I do not, gentlemen, a murderous coxcomb. What, what should such a fool do with so good a wife? And I think that could easily speak to Othello here as well as Iago. And then Othello says, are there no stones in heaven? But what serve for the thunder? Are there no thunderbolts in heaven that would be capable of inflicting heavenly justice on this theme. He calls it Iago an outra a precious and outrageous villain. He runs at Iago, Montano disarms him, and then Iago stabs Emilia from behind and exit. The woman falls, sure he has killed his wife. Now, there's a, an absolutely tragic juxtaposition that between Iago, uh, Othello's sort of bewailing of a lack of heavenly justice and then an action that just goes to prove that, uh, that the void of divine justice that this play shows to be in evidence because there is no vision of justice possible there is, there are no stones in heaven when it's a, Amelia the one who is the most courageous the one who has stood up for character for um 
what is right and noble more than anyone in the in the play and that she is immediately killed simply because Iago has been, you know, his, his involvement in the plot has been revealed. Further down, Othello says, in response to Montano, talking about Iago, tis a notorious villain, take you this weapon which I hear recovered from the moor. Come guard the door without, let him not pass, but kill him rather. I'll after that same villain, for tis a damned slave. So they say, keep... Keep Othello locked in the room, and if he comes out, try and kill him. He's on his own now. He says, I'm not well with Emilia. I'm not valiant neither, but every puny whipster gets my sword. But why should honour outlive honesty? Let it go all. And this is a really important moment in the play. This could be seen as that kind of tragic anagnorisis that we see that moment of recognition where the tragic um, hero gains some form of insight into the perhaps the, the nature of fate or destiny or the workings of the universe of God. Here, every puny whips to all these, you know, these Montano and Bresciano have got swords. So his military reputation is being lost, and this is what he realises. Why should honour, military reputation and esteem outlive honesty, actual, real, inner virtue? And this is the first time he uses that word accurately. This is the first time he uses it in the way that we we understand it, I think, and, and in the way that, in the opposite of the way in which he he uses it for Yaga. Now, Emilia is also dying. She says, more she was chased, she loved thee, cruel more, so come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, I die, I die, and again, there's a huge tragic irony about this. She is one of the only characters that genuinely does this, speaks as I think, and it is that moment where she dies. You know, this is a contrast with Yago, and it's actually, uh, in many cases, a contrast with Othello, that she's capable of both speaking and thinking directly and honestly in, that, in the real, well, in the contemporary meaning of the word honest, not the one that's connected to honour, but the one that's connected to veracity and accuracy and truth. Now, Graciano asks Othello when he comes back, what is the matter? And Othello is led to further reflection on the loss of his reputation. Behold, I have a weapon, a better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I have seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword, I have made my way through more impediments than 20 times your stop. 20 times as difficult to, you know, an obstacles as 20 times as difficult as you. Again, he, he's falling back into his military esteem. His anecdote here is telling us that he still hasn't completely relinquished this military um, reputation that he's so deeply attached to, but realizes at least here that it's a vain boast, but oh, vain boast. Who can control his fate? He realizes now, this is in a moment of anagnorisis, that. His entire destiny that he, he had supposed he was kind of stockpiling through impressive military conquests and impressive endeavours has been subject to the puniest of and smallest of human vices of jealousy and of envy. That great, big, powerful reputation has been completely undone by a single malicious individual and the human propensity to feel, um, to have small envy. And he, he seems to be realising this to a certain extent here. It is not so now. Be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. Here is my journey's end, and here is my button, very sea mark of my utmost sail. And he uses this language, you know, here is my destination and boundary of my father's journey. He uses this, you know, the, the language here is militaristic metaphor. But the interesting thing is that it's colonial metaphor. And that you can see here that there's something being suggested about, I think, how unlikely it was for Othello to to incorporate himself into this aggressive Christian colonial society that he he he's still attached to this this language of Western colonialism in terms of making sense of his own destiny as an individual tragic hero and I think that that fragmentation that is about to occur the fragmentation of Othello from his Christianized military role is being prefigured in this ex this military um, extended metaphor that he uses to describe his fate. He says, do you go back dismayed? Tis a lost fear. Man, 
but a rush against Othello's breast and he retires. Where should Othello go? And I think that, you know, referring to himself here in the third person, again, shows us that sense of self-fragmentation. He is now being detached from his identity as part of the Venetian state and his Christian self. And that, that's one of the ways that it was conventionally read as this sort of, this renouncing of, of Christianity and the, the rebirth of a savage Moorish identity. But I think it's simply the, the failure of an individual to fully absorb the norms of a culture against, well, within which rampant hostility towards him still reigns. You know, the abstractions are powerless in the face of the innate racial hostility of Venice. Now, he talks again here, he talks again to Desdemona, and it's, it's extremely disturbing this moment. He says, now, how dost thou look now, O ill-starred wench, again externalising the causes of her death, destiny itself, pale as thy smock, and he's attached to that physical pallor and innocence that you see being described here. When we shall meet at Compt, which is the last judgment, this look of, look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven and fiends will snatch it. So this look of mine, this idealised appearance, this pal this pale as thy smock that he uses, this simile, again, showing that he's seeing it through the, the lens of abstractions. That idealised vision, which is in part true in terms of her virtue, is going to hurl his soul from heaven for fiends to snatch it. It's going to cause his damnation. And he says, cold, cold, my girl, even like thy chastity. And now, there's something really important being revealed here, is that her death here is being compared to chastity, her coldness, her absence of vitality. She's something that he's been paranoid about I mean, and to a certain extent has feared throughout the play and that the chastity itself is, is, is finally proved true and that there's a, a huge tragedy in this, in this revelation for Othello because her death is like her chastity and it's precisely that coldness and chastity that, that he can't actually has never really been able to believe it in spite of his commitment to seeing her as the embodiment of virtue so her death becomes like the chastity that he, he didn't believe in and that he never could trust and there's a, an enormous kind of tragic irony about this and then he, he looks for his own punishments but again it, if you if you think about the language that he uses here to describe the, the, the physical reality of his murder of her. He says, whip me, ye devils, from the possession of this heavenly sight. Again, it's a heavenly sight in death, and he uses this kind of moralistic language to describe what's happened and to criticise himself now. Blow me about in winds, roast me in sulphur, wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. So he's now desiring the self-punishment that I think everyone in Venice has been kind of willing upon him from the word go. And here, her name, oh, Desdemon, dead, Desdemon, dead. I think there's a sense of him, of language breaking down and his idealism breaking down, where we can hear the very strong echoes of demon inside her name. And I think it's, it's his, the last vestiges of his, of his idealised abstract vision of reality crumbling. Where is this most rash and unfortunate man? That's he that was Othello. Here I am. And again, here is the fragmentation of his self is begin it well, is it, fully underway. That's he that was Othello. He can't even begin to call himself his own name because he, he sees that identity as having been lost. But again, his identity that's been lost is an abstraction. Desdemona's identity that he is so committed to is an abstraction that he can't contemplate the tarnishing of this. Where is that viper bringing forth the villain? I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. If that thou beest the devil, I cannot kill thee. So he's looking at Iago's feet, talking about how he should have, you know, cloven hooves like the devil in the Bible. And he says, if you're a devil, I cannot kill you. And Iago's lines here, I think, are supposed to very deliberately suggest his innate evil. I bleed, sir, but not kill the echoes that this sort of functions as proof of this. If you are a devil, I cannot kill thee. I bleed, sir, but not killed. I think we get a confirmation there of its innately evil character. 
here. Ludovico lower down says, O oh thou Othello that wast once so good fallen in the practice of a damned slave, what shall be said to thee? Here, you know, that his previously good, his morally um, elevated reputation is fallen in the practice of a damned slave. And, and this can be, it's fallen into the Yargo's plot, the plot of a damned slave, or has fallen as a result of this plotting. So we see this in two different ways. Is he only fallen because of Iago's plotting? Or has he just simply fallen into the plot and has in some way always been morally questionable? Why anything? An honourable murderer, if you will, for naught I did in hate, but all in honour. And this is the key point where we just see the severe extent of his illogical vision of reality. An honourable murderer is an using an oxymoron here and it's completely illogical for naught did i but in hate but all in honor honor was capable in his mind of overcoming his jealousy but that's patently not true We've seen that he that's simply how he justifies to himself and that his his murderous revenge that has been inspired by iago has actually driven the way he sees reality and has convinced him that these abstractions are real when in fact they are merely constructs of the mind. Othello says to Cassio, he apologises. Dear General, I never gave you cause. When Cassio says to him, I can't believe you wanted me killed. I do believe it and I ask your pardon. Will you, I pray, demand that demi-devil why he hath thus ensnared my soul and body? And this is a real suggestion of Iago's evil. He says, demand me nothing. What you know, you know. From this time forth I will never speak a word. So there's no logical reason or human thought that I think can soften the blow of fate with his rationale. So Iago completely refuses to give him any explanation for why he targeted him. And so he he refuses him that last vestige of, of comfort, I think, that would come from understanding. What you know, you know. He knows that Othello's vision is flawed and is likely to be um, deliberately unreliable and what all this is Pontius Pilate that, that is echoed, echoed in this that when asked about his betrayal of Jesus he says what is written is written what you know you know here Iago is, is mirroring that archetypal betrayal I never will speak a word so here he refuses now to use language ever again now the final words of the play follow the, the the social order is re-established now with um, Cassio being elevated now to Yaga, to Othello's position. And he says, you must forsake this room and go with us. Your power and your command is taken off and Cassio rules in Cyprus. For this slave, if there be any cunning cruelty that can torment him much and hold him long, it shall be his. They want to keep him alive and torture him. You shall close prisoner rest till that the nature of your fault be known to the Venetian state. Come, bring him away. So you are now going to be a close quarters prisoner until the precise nature of your of your fault, which I, I think the phrase very deliberately contains an echo of the fault of your nature, and the nature of your fault, you know, the, seeing his fault as a product of his race, racial identity and his ethnic identity. Until it's known to the Venetian state, this is the complete dismantling of his, um, the, the assembly of his reputation. Come, bring him away. This is Othello's final speech, and he is in full rhetorical command here. Tell you, soft you, a word or two before you go. I have done the state some service, and they know it no more of that. So his reputation here, he now is, is refusing to talk about, but again, he still can't quite resist bringing it up. I pray you in your letters, when you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am. Nothing extenuate nor set down aught in malice. Now, speak of me as I am. I think conflicts with with still with the state of mind that he sees here. He 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 begins with this desire to <laughs> to talk about the state service, and then asks to be spoken of exactly as he had, and with nothing extenuated, nothing changed or made lighter or easier to understand. Then must you speak of one that loved not wisely but too well. And now this again is, is, is completely inaccurate. His, 
his, his physical passion, I think, is, is in complete contrast with this idealized vision. He, he didn't love well. He didn't love intensely instead of wisely. He loved with too much with, I think, his head rather than his body. And so he didn't love well enough and loved effectively too wisely. And that's what led him to this tragic fate of one not easily jealous, but being wrought. And again, this is self-deception right until the last. He was made jealous very, very easily because of his own paranoia. Perplexed in the extreme of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. Now again, this metaphor that he uses to describe his giving up of, of um, Desdemona as the base Indian, this word is sometimes written in the quarto version as Judean. And I think it changes it, the, the, the connotation here, you know, perhaps from betrayal to primitivism. And that's heavily inflected in this particular phrase, a pearl. He described Desdemon now as a pearl. And again, it's a metaphor and, and it, it has this physical inanimate quality at the same time as it's being idealized. And that single jewel is richer than all his tribe. He has fully internalized that racial hostility that has been, that he's been surrounded by. Of one whose subdued eyes, albeit unused to the melting mood, you know, he is admitting that he's not good at crime. Drop tears as fast as the Arabian trees, their medicinable gum. Now, he's talking about him, you know, now he's crying. It's an authentic expression of his feeling, and he's crying like the way um, <clears throat> Arabian trees release myrrh. Both of these things were seen as purifying, I think. Myrrh and tears, and I think there's again some of this an effort to, to justify his behavior and, and to see it as redemptive. You know, this this these Arabian trees that release medicinal myrrh, he's talking here about the purifying redemptive quality of his tears. And I think the tragedy of this inaccuracy is, is captured by these Arabian trees. They are, um, he, he equates himself with those trees at the same time as he tries to, to, to yoke himself to a vision of Christian morality that he hasn't, for, he, he can't understand, you know, he, he cannot justify his, his murder through the lens of Christian theology. And so this simile here, he drops his tears as fast as Arabian trees, the medicinal gum, captures that tension between his, his otherness, his, his ethnic otherness, and his effort to try and adopt the lens of Christian morality. To set you down this and say besides that in Aleppo once where a malignant and turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the statement, um, damaged its reputation, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And he stabs himself. Now this is enormously important in, in the, the reading of race in this. He, you know, he describes a malignant and turbaned Turk. And what he's killing in himself now is his own internalized vision of himself through this lens. He's killing that part of himself, that way that he sees himself as some kind of ethnic other, and killing, you know, the the race, the racial and ethnic other that he is seen as in Venice. He beat a Venetian to introduce to say, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. So killing the other in himself shows the fragmentation of his identity and, and the inauthenticity of his self. And I think there's this desire here, even at the last, to try and preserve his Christian identity, which is ironic because it, at this moment in time, it's through another sin. You know, he, he hasn't been able to, to fully internalise Christian morality in a, way that, in a way that is comfortable. And this is not to say that he, he's at fault here for this. You know, the Venetian state is part of the reason that he fails to do so and, and, and Western prejudice. But here he, he supposedly kills the, the racial other and ethnic other inside of him in order to preserve his Christian identity through an action itself that is another sin and that will you know, effectively damn him according to Christian theology. And it, and it, it absolutely captures the, his failure to fully incorporate into that Western um, identification and cultural system. He falls on the bed and dies and completes the, the grim, symbolic consummation, the ironic consummation of, of, of their marriage with him and Desdemona dead inside the bed on stage, showing us that that sexual paranoia is what has facilitated 
the tragedy from the word go. And then Ludovica says, oh, Spartan dog, more fell than anguish, hunger all the sea. Look on the tragic loading of this bed. This is thy work. The object, poison, sight, let it be hid. Now, something important here. That he, he evokes silence and cruelty and envy through the calling um, <clears throat> Yago a Spartan dog that is more relentlessly destructive than anguish, hunger, or the sea. Look on the tragic loading of this bed. This is thy work. The object, poison, sight, let it be hid. Vision itself is to blame for this. This object that we're seeing here, this tragic um, inversion of the marriage consummation of Desdemona and Othello killed on their marriage, on the in their wedding sheets before they've managed to consummate the relationship. And again, the wedding sheets themselves will be untainted. Well, with with um, Desdemona's blood, although Othello has stabbed himself, so he's now probably bleeding on them. Um, and then the curtains are drawn, hiding away, I think, that tragedy and possibly implying that there is another a, a cycle of tragedy that um, could be carried on. And, and, and that, I think, is the ultimate expression of the play's bleak vision of... of the corruption of, of, of a social order that valued harmony and, and duty through realistic humanism.